Hello again, everyone. We're on to now day three of Authenticate. Welcome, everyone. Um, so this morning, our first uh, presenter, oh, before I get started on that, uh, just a reminder that you have your uh, Cvent app and the Cvent portal on the, online that you can use to submit questions, um, which you can do even in the room or you can do if you're remote. So our first presenter this morning is uh, Sebastian Elfor. He's the Senior Solutions Architect from Ubico, and he's going to be talking about uh, revised EI DAS regulations and the EU digital wallet. Um, Sebastian is uh, remote, so he'll be up on the screen in just a moment. Thank you, everyone. as a senior solutions architect at Ubico, and I'm going to present to you today <clears throat> the revised ADAS regulation and the EU digital wallet. So first of all, here's an overview of the ADAS regulation and the <clears throat> EU standardization organizations that we have been interacting with. So first of all, here's an overview of the ADAS regulation from 2014. So on the left-hand side, we have the electronic identification pillar. It consists of three items. The first item is cross-border access for citizens to public services in the EU. And uh, what that means essentially is that every EU citizen should have the possibility to access any public service in the EU. And that is achieved by using so-called ADAS nodes, and the ADAS nodes are based on a protocol called, called SAML version 2. There are low substantial and high assurance levels. Low means essentially username password. Substantial is um, one-time passwords typically, while high represents dynamic cryptographic protocols and um, hardware authenticators. So FIDO can be applied on the high assurance level. Notification of national EID schemes by the EU Commission. That means essentially that for every EU country that has a national EID scheme, these schemes can be notified by the EU Commission and then they can be used for this cross-border access. On the right-hand side, we find the qualified trust service providers, so-called QTSPs. And the one that matters the most for FIDO, that is signature and seal creation, in particular when it comes to remote signature and seal creation. And I will come back in a moment to, to what that means. The EU standardization organizations that we have been working with and matters in, in this context is on the left-hand side, Etsy. Let's say that is the European Telecommunication Standards Institute. And Etsy plays a big role here. They create the technical standards, report, and policies for ADAS. So they have created roughly 70 specifications on signatures, timestamping, certificate profiles, trust service provider policies, and so forth. It's a very technical uh, organization. In the middle, we have SEN. That means the European Committee for Standardization. And there is one working group called SAN Technical Committee 224. And that is the working group that works on the ADAS standards. SAN, they have developed in particular common criteria profiles for qualified signature creation devices, so-called QSCDs, policies for certification authorities and common criteria profiles for all of that. On the right-hand side, we have ENISA, uh, that is the EU Cybersecurity Agency. And ENISA is responsible for the EU Cybersecurity Act and implementing that in, in the entire European Union. ENISA, they have created policies and guidelines for ADAS, like analysis of trust service providers, analysis of BID schemes, QCDs, and so forth. So the final alliance uh, has interacted with, first of all, the EU Commission itself and all of these standardization organizations in 2020, prior to the ADAS revision, and we have also worked with them um, after the ADAS revision came out. The purpose of all of this has been to promote FIDO as an authentication protocol for the ADAS services. 
So how did we do that? Yeah, first of all, um, we have submitted uh, feedback to the EU Commission. That was a so-called ADAS inception impact assessment. And what we did there was we took the FIDE Alliance ADAS white paper, we packaged that and rewrote it a little bit, and we sent it to, to the European Commission. Then when it comes to Etsy, we were invited to provide feedback to the Etsy Technical Report 119460. And that report was about remote identity proofing. And I will come back to in a minute what the result became of that. When it comes to NISA, we had a couple of meetings with NISA in particular to um, strengthen the case that FIDO can indeed be used as an ADAS EID scheme high protocol. And we also submitted the FIDO Alliance white paper to them. So the result of all of this is in February 2021, Etsy issued the technical report 119460. And that is all about identity proofing in the EU, remote identity proofing, I should say. And we provided feedback to that Etsy report, both at, as uh, the Fire Alliance itself and also a couple of member companies. And what happened is that the final Alliance ADAS white paper is now referenced in the Etsy report, which means that FIDO has become recognized for ADAS, uh, which is actually the first time that happens uh, for Etsy. And uh, at the bottom, you can find a quote from the Etsy report where they re refer to the um, final Alliance white paper. So they now recognize FIDO to be used for EID level high. Second, ENISA came out with a report in March 2021. And uh, they also issued a report on the same subject, remote identity proofing. And they actually referred to the ETS report in, in that document. And um, as I mentioned before, we gave them feedback in a meeting in 2020, and it gave results. So FIDO is now also referenced as an EAD scheme and the ENISA report. And we have also described this in a blog post which is linked right here in the presentation. And here you can also find a quote um, in the ENISA report. Furthermore, we have proposed that FIDO can be used for secure access to a remote sign in QTSP. So what is all of that? So yes, on the right hand side, you find the qualified trust service provider, which can be used for signing documents centrally in the cloud, that is. So the user on the left-hand side has the document to be signed and the FIDO authenticator. So the user can use FIDO2 in order to authenticate to the web of an relying party here in the cloud, in the QTSP. By using this uh, FIDO2 authentication, the SSA, which means the signature server application, can connect to the HSM, the hardware security module, whereby the FIDO authentication session can be used by the signature activation module in the HSM, and that can in turn be used for unlocking the private key in the QSD, meaning that the document that was originally submitted from the user here can be sent all the way to the QSD where it's hashed and created uh, with a qualified electronic signature. The FIDO can be used for this secure authentication process. Moving on a bit, so the findings and the results of uh, the ADAS revision was published in June 2021 after two years of public service and expert committees. And the FIDO Alliance has um, participated both in the public service and also in the expert committees to some extent. So the findings are the following. First of all, there were a couple of issues with the EID schemes. There are quite a few member states that have recognized the EID schemes on EU level. It's 19 member states at the moment, uh, which is not uh, as much as uh, the EU has hoped for. It's very low cross-border interoperability. Uh, in fact, it's only about 50,000 transactions per year in the entire European Union that are cross-border, which is a very low number, of course. There are also a couple of privacy issues with the EIDs. 
meaning that if you have an X519 certificate, the entire certificate will be exposed if you authenticate or identify yourself to a service. So all of those issues should be addressed. There are also a couple of gaps when it comes to trust service providers, in particular, when it comes to authenticate securely. And the reason is that when the QCD was created for ADAS in 2014, it was only a local QCD that was um, specified. So the remote QCD, that is something that should be created and defined in ADAS version two. There's also a need to harmonize with the EU changing legal landscape. So first of all, we have the EU Cybersecurity Act that came out in 2019. So there's um, an interest to harmonize the ADAS regulation with, with this act, of course. There's also a new directive called the EU NIS directive, and there's also a NIS 2 directive coming out. And that directive means that if a qualified trust service provider needs to report data, they can do so under the NIS directive instead. Furthermore, we have the EU single digital gateway regulation that will also create a push for digital identification on the internet, and that will come in force in 2023, 24. So, so that could also be a way to push for um, identification. And finally, there are a couple of uh, technical standards that have emerged since ADAS came out in 2014. In particular, we have, of course, the, the web of fan standard, we have FIDA2, um, there's also the OpenID Connect standard. So, so there are a, quite a few very good, robust technical standards that have been implemented in, in many, many operating systems that ADAS could take into account. So the improvements in the revised ADAS regulation are the following. First of all, we have the EU digital identity wallet. Uh, that is the major breakthrough, I should say, in ADAS version two. The e-digital identity wallet will be mandatory for all EU member states to provide identity wallets. Previously, it was uh, voluntarily to issue an EID on a national level. Now it will become mandatory. There is a common toolbox that will standardize this EU digital identity wallet. And there is an ADAS expert group that is currently working on that. The standards are not yet defined, but uh, in the ADAS reports that were produced in June, um, there are some indications that W3C verifiable credentials could be used for the um, digital wallet. There are also, um, they also mentioned the European blockchain service infrastructure called EBCI, uh, where you can put the credentials that have been issued uh, under W3C standard. And there is also European self-service, self-sovereign identity framework and so forth. So there are quite a few standards out there that can be reused um, in order to develop this EU digital identity wallet. Finally, there are a couple of privacy issues to be addressed, as I mentioned before. And um, one solution to that will be if you only want to present a couple of attributes, for example, your age, that could be possible to expose only, so you don't have to reveal the entire ID. The authentication to remote signature services will also be improved. So there are a number of SAM standards that have been created, and they will now formally regulate, and also legally in the ADAS version 2 regulation, how authentication to remote QCD can function. And that's where the signature activation module comes to play. Finally, uh, we have harmonization with other EU regulations. So the EU NIS directive uh, is, uh, is a very good candidate to be used for this harmonization. There's also a new certification scheme coming out, EU CC, it's an EU common criteria certification scheme that uh, can be used also for uh, EU digital identity wallets and such products. And finally, the EU single digital gateway regulation can also create a push for ADAS version two. The EU digital wallet ecosystem looks like this. In the middle, we have the EU wallet itself. It is a national EID 
um, and it contains attributes such as age, gender, owner of driving license, can be your profession if you're an engineer, your tax residency, and so forth. And in order to get these attributes and credentials, there are a number of trusted sources here, could be national EAD issuer, tax register, uh, professional um, company, and so forth. And all of them can, of course, issue credentials and attributes to this wallet that will be gathered here. The use cases are, on the other end, you can access eGov and eHealth applications, could be access to different platforms, could be private platforms and public platforms, uh, could be access to financial services, and, and many, many more use cases. The timeline for the ADAS rollout uh, is estimated as follows. So it was adopted in June 2021. So the past three months, there has been agreement on process and working procedures. And that's where Etsy, ENISA, ESI, SEN, and, and the EU Commission, where they have agreed how to, to move this forward. The work that's going on currently from September to December is agreement on technical architecture outline. And Etsy had a workshop last week where the file alliance participated and we presented a file that can be used in, in such an ecosystem. So we are making pretty good progress on that front. Then the three months after that, the, there will be identification of specific technical architecture standards and so forth. So then the um, standards will be written, so to speak. Then the coming 12 months, there will be pilots and the rollout will happen in 2023 to 2024. This time is of course tentative, but it, this is the estimate that we have at the moment. So how do we interact with the EU right now? So we have created an ADAS task force to interact with Etsy, the EU Commission and ENISA. That is a task force that sorts under the Five Alliance European uh, working group. And the purpose here is, of course, to promote FIDA as a protocol for the EU digital wallet ecosystem and for other services in ADAS version 2. So the potential standards that uh, we are considering is, first of, of all, of course, FIDO and WebOfan. Uh, that's what we're coming from. It's quite likely that W3C verifiable credentials and presentations will be part of the EU digital wallet. And we are also looking to uh, the self-issued OpenID Connect SIOP protocol. And the reason for that is that the ISO mobile driving license will also rely upon uh, a SIOP. So in order to get interoperability with the mobile driving license system, this is a pretty good uh, candidate to work with. So here's an overview of how to register with FIDO for, for the e-wallet by using SIOP, W3C, and FIDO. So first of all, the holder identify himself or herself to the QTSP up here. Uh, the QTSP can host a wallet, a so-called SaaS wallet, or the wallet can also be present on the device. So the enrollment can either take place centrally here at the QTSP or locally at the device. FIDO can be used as part of the enrollment, meaning that you use FIDO in order to download the W3C credentials to the local wallet. FIDO can also be used for remote online identification as well. The verifiable credentials are put on a blockchain. And um, then in step three, we can use OpenID in order to register either the QTSP with the e-wallet or the device with a wallet to a relying party. The other scenario that we have considered is online file authentication for the e-wallet. And in this case, we are considering a hosted SaaS e-wallet at the issuer. So what happens basically is, is that the user, the holder, tries to use a device, use online access to the relying party. The relying party will then return an ID token request in an open ID SIOP format. FIDO will be used in step three for the authentication from the device. And in step four, there is the identification step with PIN or biometrics, meaning that uh, the credentials will now be released up here in the hosted wallet. 
And finally, the ID token response will be submitted back um, as a verifiable presentation to the relying party where it will be validated in conjunction with a verifiable credential from the blockchain. Finally, we have the offline authentication. This is the last slide. So first of all, the user uses an out-of-band authentication for authentication. You can use FIDODAR in order to retrieve the attributes in W3C format. The pin code or bio is used here as well for the identification. In step three, there is an offline access request that can be done over NFC or Bluetooth, for example. And here in step four, OpenID can be used in order to get the ID token request. And since we now have downloaded the credentials, the ID token response can be submitted with a verifiable uh, presentation to the reader, where it's verified in step 5b with a credential. That was my last slide. So I think we can open up the floor for uh, questions. Sebastian, um, do we have any? Yes, we have one question here from the audience. Hi, this is Daryl Goyce. Can you speak to Apple and Google Wallet versus EU Wallet? Are they different? Is it a public option? Is that by design? Or will they be working together? The Google and the Apple wallets, they are mainly intended for uh, financial transactions, while the EU digital wallet will have a much broader scope. Um, so it could be that there will be a cooperation on, on particular on the financial side. But the EU digital wallet will also contain more information, in particular by the QTSPs um, around uh, the European Union. Uh, no. Hey, Sebastian, Matthijs here. Um, which uh, DIT method are you suggesting using with verifiable credentials? You're using your own blockchain or European blockchain, I think? Uh, that is up for discussion in the ADAS expert group. So there will be a blockchain, of course. Um, it could be the EBSI, uh, which is the European Union blockchain uh, system. That is quite likely. That is what is referred to in the ADAS report that came out in June. Uh, but it remains to be seen. Uh, the standardization work is uh, progressing as we speak. So we will see what come out of that um, standardization work. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? No, I think we're done. So Sebastian, thank you very much. Um, great presentation. Thank you. Thanks for having me.